The following is a presentation of the Four Center podcast feed. From the center of the galaxy, this is a Four Center podcast feed. I'm Ken Hamsock. I'm Joseph Scrimshaw. And I'm Jennifer Landa. We're here to talk about news, breaking news from a long time ago and breaking news from, well, the morning of our recording session. It's nice to get news before we press record. We're going to get into Jedi Survivor, Star Wars Jedi Survivor, the video game, the big trailer. We got Dave Filoni speaking, will people listen? And Damon Lindelof with his first public comments about Star Wars. We'll see. We'll dive into that. Plus, at this day in history, before we get on, get to all that, today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day 30, 30 free trial at audibletrial.com slash Force Center. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. And as always, a little bit later, our Force Center recommends an audiobook we think you should try out on us. Let's catch up, talk about Star Wars, lives, and how it all intersects. Jen, how are you doing? I am doing well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, I'm feeling good. I worked out this morning. I'm trying to, you know, develop good habits is yes. my latest thing. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Is your trepidation that you're not having fun developing good habits or? It's really freaking hard. It's it really is. hard, especially because I am an emotional eater. I'm just an emotional, mm-hmm. I, I react to things so emotionally and I comfort myself with all the things I probably should not be comforting myself with, you know? <laughs> glass of wine, five guys, burger and fries. Like, Oh, you know, bad day. Reward myself with this good day. Reward myself with this. So yeah. Yeah. Trying to Uh, curb those habits. Yes. The the martinis and smash burgers I had this weekend uh, relate. Oh, that sounds good stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, Jen, you'll find the balance. Star Wars life. That's right. I must channel my my inner Jedi. She's in there somewhere. <laughs> Did you have a uh, specific Star Wars adventures as you were uh, trying not to eat uh, Five Guys? <laughs> you know, uh, the only thing Star Warsy was a George Lucas action figure that is still in my Amazon cart after our Ooh. figure fights uh, episode mm. this past week. I was like, you know what? I need to buy that figure, and then I was like, do I really need the figure? So he's in my cart. I have not purchased him because that's another habit that I'm trying to curb, which is impulsive shopping. Mm. Um, But in Star Wars adjacent, and I say that because it was Disney, I went to go see The Lion King yesterday. Uh, Oh, man. I had seen it many, many years ago um, in New York. And uh, so I was excited to see it this time in the Los Angeles Pantages Theater with my daughter. It Mm. was, I think, even more magical than I remembered it. Just Mm. I was welling up with emotion and I had a thought where I was like, what if they could ever do a star Wars musical like this? (laughs) (laughs) Probably not. Probably not. But, uh, it just was, it was outstanding. Highly recommend it. That's awesome. Yeah. I I really, really love the Pantages. Uh, Mm -hmm. I I don't know where you sat, but it just, it it is such a great large space that still feels, uh, intimate, still feels like you're close to everything. Oh, my daughter was mesmerized. She's like, when, when did they make this? When did they build this building? And I was like, oh, <laughs> let's look it up. 1930. It's been there a long time. Yeah, yeah. You know, fun pictures of various award ceremonies happening there over the years. Yeah, it's mm. a super cool space. I love the idea of a Star Wars musical. Like, I think you know, all the jokes go to The Simpsons and, you know, Luke be a Jedi tonight and all that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Man, it would be amazing <laughs> if they did if they did like the kind of the galaxy's edge treatment of like, we don't star Wars is popular enough. Now we don't need it to just be like, here's the empire strikes back. And (laughs) Hans, uh, Han and Leia's I love you. I know duet. Uh, (laughs) But instead it's like, here's a musical that would be internal to star Wars that Mm -hmm. I think that we're kind of at that level of society. That's meta enough that it'd be like, yeah, sure. We'll, we'll see. We'll see the musical that maybe uh, Leia and Han went on a date to. (laughs) I think it could, I think it could totally happen. I mean, they do some incredible, um, visuals in the Lion King where they're projecting like this, this, you know, night sky with the stars. I guess that's maybe what may, made me think about it. I was like, Oh, I don't know. There's some stars and some, an X-wing <laughs> coming in. Right. I, I actually think it's possible. They have an, a frozen musical. So why not a Star Wars musical? 
Yeah, like a Star Wars opera about like, you know, it doesn't even have to be the real history of, you know, Jedi versus Sith, but it could be, you know, a tale that's existed in the galaxy. Now I'm getting excited about this idea. Right? You've heard some things I like here. I, you know, uh, I saw Moulin Rouge at Pantasia. It's amazing what they can pull <gasps> off. You know, I think when you think of, uh, even even with Broadway, you think of Star Wars on stage, you think of some, you know, poor stagehands pushing up a, a cardboard Star Destroyer set. It's, it's not that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? So yeah. Like, uh, I saw I cats see. there, so, I you know, know. They Oh, I into, love uh, you. Love cats. I know. <laughs> Still, <laughs> do it exactly the oh same. Oh my gosh! We'll I'm pitch excited. It. We'll pitch it. <laughs> Quite the Star Wars adventures uh, there, Jen. Thank you very much. Getting us uh, excited about ideas. Uh, Joseph, uh, I saw some of your Instagram activity this weekend. You had some exciting frozen pizza ideas. <laughs> I'm sure Star Wars was there. Yes, Frozen Pizza the Musical. That's what I worked on. All, no, um, uh, my wife is out of town uh, visiting some family in the Midwest. Um, uh, kind of a, a, an emergency health thing, so we didn't really plan it. Uh, over the weekend was our, our anniversary of arriving in Los Angeles. We, we uh, arrived on St. Patrick's Day. So it's always fun for Sarah and I to figure out what to do. We're like, we should go to this bar. We should stay out late here. No, it's St. Patrick's Day. Uh, and. This one falling on a Friday. I was like, mm, I'm not sure. Uh, but I, I walked into Hollywood and I, I went to the Roosevelt Roosevelt Hotel lobby, the Roosevelt, uh, Roosevelt Hotel, the famous mm. steeped in, in history. And you can just hang out in the lobby and have a martini. So mm. I did that and it was great. Stopped on some record stores and some bookstores on the way. And you know what? St. Patrick's Day was not even that wild. I walked home down mm. Hollywood Boulevard at like 8 p.m. And uh, the most upsetting thing I saw is that there's a, it's not even upsetting. It was just funny. There's an uh, Irish bar and then there's like kind of a, a cantino, a cantina type place, not the actual scum and villainy, but a little bit more of a cantina vibe, you know, that it, you, you can get tacos and uh, you can get, uh, you know, a different fare than traditional Irish fare. And there was a much longer line to celebrate St. Patrick's Day at the cantina than the Irish bar right next door. <laughs> like, <laughs> so it goes. So it goes. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, so that that was really fun. That, that was a good time. Um, and then for Star Wars Adventures, um, I've been working on a couple creative projects that uh, are really tapping into uh, my own love of things that I talk about on the podcast and we talk about a lot of the the adventure serial structure and the pulp and some of the kind of the the roots of Star Wars. So I've been reading and watching some more of that. I was watching a Batman and Robin uh, adventure serial. Uh, I've been reading uh, The Shadow and actual, you know, pulp from back in the day. Uh, I watched the great stop motion famous uh, Ray Harryhausen film, Jason and the Argonauts this weekend. So I didn't mm. watch Star Wars, but I felt like I watched and read a bunch of the foundation of Star Wars. And oh, man, I, not not every Star Wars fan, I think, is necessarily going to like that. That that side of Star Wars is not always going to be fans favorite part. But ooh, if you're at all interested in your Star Wars fan, I think really checking out some of that stuff that that George grew up loving that that mm. finds its way into Star Wars and Indiana Jones. It's It's really insightful as to why Star Wars is the way it is sometimes. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely is. Yeah, that's part of the part of the full, well-rounded Star Wars fan experience going all yeah. the way to the beginnings. Yeah, I think so. And yeah, I, don't, I don't think anybody has to do homework to watch Star Wars. I just find it it really fascinating. Mm. Well, yes. wonderful weekend. Yeah. Well, talking and drinking and pizzing. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I did it all. I did it all. Uh, how about you, Ken? What were your adventures? Uh, look, I'm going to try to stop myself and slow myself and, and not go into a rant. All right. This is what's going on. I, and I might do this on my podcast of blathering. So uh, cross promotion there. I had a great, um, great time this weekend. Uh, busy weekend, but I took some time for myself to do some work, uh, actually prepare some stuff for figure fights, upcoming episodes and sat and watched uh, the documentary uh, sort of co- co- homecoming with, with Bono Edge and, and David Letterman. Now I know those three names aren't necessarily going to be loved across the board. And I don't need them to be loved across the board. Uh, U2's music, literally no hyperbole, hyperbole. That's a Brian Regan joke. Hyperbole. Um, <laughs> saved my life at one point in the early 2000s. I love that band. Uh, I know there's some thoughts on them, blah, 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 blah. But I saw, I love, that was a great documentary. And it was about looking back. It was about 40, 50 years, reimagining, re growing, changing. And can you still find new meaning in old things? All those wonderful, you could tie all Star Wars themes. But I also saw discourse online about, Ah, they're overrated. Ah, they sucked. And I, and I just, I got really bummed. I got really bummed that that we here on Force Center fight for the right to, uh, you know, not just enjoy things 
like it's a spoonful of sugar, but to enjoy things because of the way it affects you, uh, other people's perspectives, uh, looking back and, and, and recognizing the actual history of, of Star Wars, the prequels. You can't deny that the prequels uh, weren't, you know, unilaterally loved, but you also can't deny that they influenced the entire, entire generation. I just, I, so I just got, I had this weird battle. I think how we look at Force Center is really just affecting how we look at everything else. Uh, uh, to call a legendary band overrated means you deny history. You deny the actual impact that that band had on uh, pop culture and uh, social issues, uh, the times. Uh, it, 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 that kind of stuff drives me a little crazy. It's not just a music fan, but um, just a fan of things. When you're, There's great meaning in things. And if it's not for you, it's not for you. Uh, but why use words of war <laughs> when just <laughs> writing a lot of these things? And it just now um, goes into everything I discuss. It doesn't mean there's everything, again, talk about bands or David Letterman highly influenced me. And I don't need everyone to agree with that, you know, or agree with him or like him. Um, he's 75 now, which is crazy to think. So it's a definitely wow. different era. I'm definitely an old man sitting there going, yeah, my day, Jack Benny was hilarious. You know, I guess. <laughs> he was yeah. though. He really was. He was. Yeah. <laughs> was. And, and things he's are up the time. And I, and I just made me think too, there was a conversation I had about a year ago at a birthday party where someone said, yeah, you know, I try to show the original, and this was a younger person, younger person. I try to show the original trilogy to my friends and we, eh, they don't really like it. It's not my favorite either. Just looks bad. It is. The effects are cheesy. I don't know. I don't like it, which again is a valid uh, experience and valid perspective. And I understand it. But then to take that, if you were to push it beyond the boundaries and, 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 and say those movies, suck or those yeah. movies are overrated it means you're denying the influence you're denying the lines outside the <laughs> the chinese theater around the corner you're denying the, the blockbuster impact of that and jaws and other things and, and it's just not what i'm here for so i got i got i got really angry this weekend but then i got i got really peaceful just watching this documentary about a band i love yeah. <laughs> going to ireland and the history and the importance of the band especially uh, for their where they, the culture they emerged from so it was all star wars themes and it was all on disney plus so i just felt like <laughs> so, in the interview anyway, george lucas right in the interview george lucas i, mean, I, I don't know i don't listen to music i don't, I don't know what george listens to okay that's fascinating oh anyway, wow. i'll end the rant there but it was a hodgepodge of emotions but it was a good weekend understandable understandable emotions like U2 is not has never been my favorite band like I like a couple of their songs but they never really they never really hit for me yeah uh but instead of <laughs> needing you to agree I'm much more interested in why did why did they strike a chord for you and mm. right. to me that's just in general much more rewarding and interesting to try to understand why somebody else loves it you know than yeah. try to convince you that you didn't have the life experiences you had yeah, yeah, or 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 to try to deny that Joshua Tree happened or Octon Baby happened, in which they were everywhere, right? Yes. And it doesn't oh. feel like that now to maybe a thirty-year-old who's thirty now, right? And and I hate being the you weren't there ninety-two man when the fly showed up, like you weren't there. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know what I mean? That's that's also the other part of it too. Exactly what you said is 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 cool. Why did it connect for you? Because it didn't connect for me. Good way to have conversation, especially around Star Wars. Yeah, and and it, I I always find that kind of perception fascinating. I remember reading a Sinatra book, and I, I already knew a lot about Sinatra, but I, there's always more context to be learned. And and you know, hearing about this other singer who, when uh, when he was mostly putting out singles before albums really became a thing, full length concept albums, that this singer was his greatest competition. And I was like, wow, I I would have never known that context because I wasn't alive then in that blip of time where that was true. And then I learned about a new singer. Mm. Yeah. Fast. And, you know, that new show, Daisy and the Six, has now reached a new generation where they're interested in, like, Fleetwood Mac. Mm. And for a long time, Fleetwood Mac was not really – it was considered, like, old, old people music. Well, now, like, amongst young people, they're kind of having resurgence. People are like, oh, my gosh, what about Stevie Nicks and Lindsey Buckingham and their romance? And they're <laughs> doing all these deep dives. I'm like, oh, my gosh, are we living – not that I was, a, you know, mm. the 70s. <laughs> yeah. Not an adult, but, like – we went through that where that was, they were really popular and stuff. So who knows? You two could have their moment 10 years from now, if they do some sort of like TV adaptation loosely based on the band. And the, yeah. That, or, or just someone needs to do a popular TikTok with a song and yeah. you know, um, right. there you go. There you go. <laughs> That's, uh, yeah. The Mac stuff for that too. I do like uh, that one. Yeah. 
Is that there you go? Mm-hmm. There you go. Um, we are gonna get to some news, but before we do, we are gonna stop and have our ask section here. Uh horns and trumpets blaring here. We've been having a lot of fun revamping things like Patreon, YouTube, uh, more coming. But Joseph, we have a big ask related to Patreon. That is right. We are building up Patreon. Uh, we have uh, the exciting news that we are doing the Indiana Jones in the Perilous podcast. Part of the reason that I'm really uh, fascinated with the adventure serial and the pulp because that is there in Indiana Jones in a huge way, the same way it is in Star Wars. Ken and I recorded the first episode and uh, it actually was released on Patreon yesterday. Chapter one, the adventure begins. Ken and I discussing how we first encountered Indiana Jones, why we think the character and the world is special, uh, Indy's uh, archaeological skills, that whole great debate. We get into all of that. So that episode is up for patrons now. But we are building toward uh, the goal of 2000 a month where we are going to do a new YouTube series. And by we, I mean Jennifer. Uh, (laughs) When Force Center started out many, many moons ago, Jennifer did a couple great shows, uh, Jedi Beat uh, and and Happy Beeps, Jedi Beeps, uh, if we want to combine them, great (laughs) deep dives into uh, Star Wars topics. And when we reach that goal, Jennifer is going to create all new visuals and create a YouTube series out of series out of those uh, classic episodes. Yes, I would love to do this. Uh, this is would seriously be like my documentary series. <laughs> <laughs> I have so many ideas. I mean, I might even weave in me on camera walking through the fog, like a like a hard copy <laughs> episode or something. I don't know. <laughs> please. <laughs> can you, can you please make like a Jonathan Frank's uh, or Frank's, uh, you know, no, Frank's, untrue, yeah. false. <laughs> I would love to. This it just oh, it would be, bring me such joy. And um, yeah, I have all a lot of these clips and and photos that I've already have in my my folders waiting to be released on YouTube. Love that, love that. It is all about the goals, which helps with the the uh, you know the workflow, the the work time, and all that kind of good stuff. That's the realities of it. But it's it's dreaming big here. I can't wait to see. Can we? We might just need to do an Amazon wish list to get Jen a fog machine. Then. That, that. <laughs> yeah. How would I do that? I'd love to do it on like the the bridge in Pasadena. How cool would that be? That's oh, right. beautiful, yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Right. I don't know if they let people on that bridge anymore. Anyway, love sorry. It. Love it, love it, love it, love it. So there you go. It is our ask. And yes, that Indian Jones of the Perilous Podcast, that first episode was such a blast to record. Didn't know what to expect. I was even nervous going in. It was, uh, you know, unfamiliar territory, even though it's movies we love. And it's a great conversation. So more on the way. Yeah, ton of fun. And so if you want to check it out, uh, patreon.com slash four center to see if it's for you. And if it's not, as always, we understand. And thanks for listening. Thanks for listening, indeed. And let's get into some Star Wars news. If you're listening on the podcast, uh, you know, it's time for news. If you jumped ahead on the YouTube video because you just want to get to the news, hi, we're Force Center. Welcome to this uh, news segment here. Uh, It is uh, time to talk about the big trailer, the the story trailer for Star Wars Jedi Survivor. I got to learn to say it like that. I've been saying it wrong all the time. Jedi Order, the Survivors. It's Star Wars Jedi survivor uh big trailer was revealed there was kind of uh, some hype it was it was nice to feel hype for something instead of just something you wake up and something's there we knew monday 9 a.m pacific uh this one minute 47 second or so trailer dropped full of action again story not necessarily gameplay though you get to see some of that in there uh and you get a feel for it there has been some of the stuff out there already but the big thing was the story the timeline all those things so we will dive in with some highlights themes and general thoughts jennifer i want to start with you trailer highlights anything that jumped out to you um you know truth be told i have not ever played this game but i am fascinated by it and i'm determined to play this one um i liked that cal is part of the the mantis crew i believe it i'm forgive me i don't mm-hmm. know but um mm-hmm. I like that there's that weird captain. Uh, is his name Grease? Mm-hmm. Um, I really like the relationship between Cal and and Marin. Um, I think it seems really interesting. I know people are really excited that that character is is back. I'm not sure what happened to her in the first one. So, um, but it was just really exciting actually to see on Twitter how hyped people were. I mean, it was overwhelmingly positive, which, which is not something that you see on Twitter a lot. So that right. got me really excited to, to try this game out. I, I love the perspective too. It's an honest perspective. And and we have different, uh, three of us have different, uh, I think, uh, 
um, views on the games uh, from a lot of other folks. We don't uh, play these games as much. Uh, I definitely play games every day too much, but, um, you know, um, don't don't dive in like a classic gamer. I'm not going to gatekeep myself out of having fun, though. But, Jen, I love your perspective <laughs> about it. Do you feel uh, – how do you feel, feel going in? Do you, you, do you need to – you're going to just jump in or try to jump in, not not uh, go back? Or are you just going to Wikipedia and Wikipedia the summary on the first one? That's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to Wikipedia it. That's kind of what I did. <laughs> I have a general idea about these characters. Isn't there also, is there like a novel that's based on this or like, mm-hmm. some, yeah. So maybe I could even read that to kind of learn more about this because it seems like there's a lot at stake and I don't know what that means, <laughs> but I would like to know. <laughs> I think it would improve, but it, you know, at the end of the day, it just looks like a fun game and that's really all that I care about. And looks yeah, beautiful. Story. We'll say that a lot. It looks beautiful. Mm-hmm. Uh, epic, epic. All those big words. Uh, rock star words there. Uh, love that. Yeah, Battle Scars by Sam Mags is uh, out and about. We're going to take a dive in. It's now New York Times bestseller. So a lot of people uh, love the uh, story, these characters uh, that uh, you're talking about, Jen. So mm-hmm. a lot there. A lot there. Just with some uh, highlights for you in the trailer. Yeah, I, I I have not read Battle Scars yet. I haven't uh, cracked, oh, I've cracked it open to literally uh, look at it and <laughs> go, yeah. wow, I wish I, look at these words. I want to put them in my brain. I must find time. Uh, but I, so I, I might not be entirely caught up because I know other people have had a chance to, to read the whole book and react and all that. Um, but I think part of what's going on with Marin is, I, unless I am mistaken, I believe she was withheld from the initial trailer. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, the initial trailer had, I think, raised a little bit of that question of we left Cal off with the crew and he seemed like he was he was visiting Sarah who was you know one of the crew members um, but we kind of didn't know where Grease was we didn't know where Marin was that was the vibe to me of the early promotion of Jedi Survivor so I kind of thought that the book might deal with the fracturing of that group and I think it might up to a point all that is to say is to me it was a question in my mind of how much is Marin going to factor into the game in the fact right. that we saw Marin in this trailer footage and uh, multiple aspects of Marin, right? We saw her as uh, what you want in Star Wars is just, hey, some cool, great combat moves, uh, you know, a surviving Night Sister in action out in the galaxy, amazing, beautiful, but also to have her is the sort of um, the advisor or, or somebody at least who kind of understands the journey that Cal is on and the, the threats that we'll talk about more when we get into the kind of big themes and ideas. But it also just got me kind of to the point of like, are we going to be able to play Marin? Is it going to be, I know, I know it's a, it's a Cal centric game, but are, is this going to be the kind of game where, Hey, maybe Cal gets captured and we get to play Marin (laughs) for a couple of, uh, you know, chapters of the game. So the Mm -hmm. Marin of it all was a massive highlight to me. Yeah. I think the other big highlight was seen, uh, again, I might've, uh, missed something but the mystery to me person in what looks like high republic era robes right uh the Mm. the some some sort of jedi like figure or else somebody who just found some cool robes and has strong opinions about the galaxy uh (laughs) but a jedi like person uh, you know a lightsaber on their hilt throwing down that stormtrooper helmet and saying how could you let the galaxy fall to this unworthy machine of an empire Mm. that got me really excited Uh, that they've been doing such a good job of taking ideas developed all across, you know, screen stories, publishing stories, video game stories, and, and working them all together to sort of see something. Maybe uh, somebody from the High Republic era who's been, you know, in hiding, taking the brush vow, and this is a species that lives a long time, or else some fallen Jedi who's just <laughs> cosplaying High Republic to put on the, the clothes of the good old days. Uh, it's mm-hmm. fascinating. Mm. Yeah, I, I think we'll talk about that more in themes there. I love what you're saying there. I think that was my favorite part of the trailer as well. Um, though at 29 seconds, the frog like creature on the ground begging for its life. That doesn't look good for that creature, but the creature looks awesome. <laughs> oh, I love that. Creature. Made me feel for a little frog guy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> really did. Mm-hmm. Really did. A lot there. Anything else on the table, Joseph, before I. That, those were the kind of the highlights for me of what was most exciting. And then, you know, the ideas, the ideas. The ideas, the ideas. Yeah, I'm with you on uh, the Marin of it all and, and the fact that there's a couple clips of looks like Marin's at least fighting alongside of you. So I love your idea of 
little switcheroo. It was fun, like Battlefront Story, where you get to control Luke for a bit, or Lando and Trip. Like, hey, I like that stuff. Switch it up along the way. But I, I, I'm with you. I know it's a, it's a Cal-centric kind of game or story. Uh, at least he's the center of it there. But she, Marin's just become such a popular character and, and emerged uh, almost a scene stealer in the last uh, video game. So uh, mm-hmm. I'm excited to see that. Uh, and just again, uh, yeah, it seems like I'm just throwing these these words at the wall. But but the 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 scale of of the the worlds and and the views and the vistas and the ships coming in and all those kind of Star Warsy things. Going to your point, Jen, of um, uh, just it looks fun. It looks great. And I had some issues with Fallen Order, mostly because I just kept falling off things. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I so I'm hoping for some gameplay improvements. And I always joke about about the killing of the animals thing. It looks like at least that's been addressed in the game, or at least like knowledge part of it. Not because now you can ride the animals. All that stuff aside, that's almost just become uh, me having fun with that idea. I I, I I want. I'm looking for some gameplay improvements, but uh, that that will come. Uh, but it's it's a story. It's the world, it's the time period. I'm I'm really excited about by the jump in time, the five years. Uh, also, I don't quite remember when Fallen Order took place. Hmm. <laughs> I have to go watch an Alex video. I can't quite remember. <laughs> I think it was uh, like five years in. Five years in. Okay. So then, th- so this is around the time of the Kenobi series. Around the time Rough. of Kenobi, yeah, um, roughly. Not holding you to that. Yeah, no, just <laughs> just general math. Okay, <laughs> that's interesting. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot happening, and I love it, and I love it there as well. But let's dive into the themes. I think I'm I'm withholding because uh, there's a lot of things they presented in here. So, Joseph, we'll start with you. What, what got you excited about uh, what's at play, literally, the, the, the stakes of the game? Yeah, I think the, the question hanging over this entire era when you're telling a story of a Jedi and, and in a video game, it's particularly powerful because it's you. You're, you it's it's mm-hmm. Cal, but you are literally going through it. You are literally <laughs> falling off a cliff with him when he falls yeah. off a cliff. And uh, it creates this very interesting, intimate re- uh, relationship with the character that kind of heightens that question of how can they have a victory in a time mm-hmm. where they can't defeat the empire single-handedly right Mm -hmm. and and that's a canon thing that's a lore thing but it's also becoming this really rich and interesting idea of how do different characters deal with the fact that right now you can't make everything right for the galaxy all you can do is help to the best of your ability how Mm -hmm. are you going to define that what is that going to be for you and there was definitely those issues and ideas in uh, the, the first game, Jedi Fallen Order. But I like what is th- the idea that's being put forward by these trailers, this one in, in particular, that Cal is just kind of trying to fight the good fight and help people where he can and stay alive himself. Uh, but we're seeing and we're playing, it means he's just going around <laughs> slaughtering yeah. Imperials. So Marin really setting the table of what is the cost of endless conflict of, you know, Fire can keep you warm, but it, it, it will also consume you of this classic Star Wars story of it is good and right to fight for people who need help. But at what point do you just become the fighting? And then the the trailer, if it, if it was just there, I'd be like, OK, cool, great. We got to address those, those things. But then I, I love that it suggests that there is a, a, a potential end game where they seem to find this other place, a home you know, yeah. a, a piece, something worth fighting for. for. You know, I, I didn't write down the exact quote, but Cal says, if we, like, if we can't find hope, and I kind of interpret that as, if we can't, you know, just the two or three of us save the whole galaxy right now, maybe we need something better to fight for a, a, a peaceful place for at least this group of people. Hmm. That's really fascinating to me. Um, and, and final thought, I apologize for going on, hmm. but my final thought is, I, I've... Uh, learned that term and discussed it before, ludonarrative dissonance, mm-hmm. uh, the idea that when a story that you are taking part in, particularly a video game, is stating the beliefs uh, of the characters, but then asking you as the player to take actions that are maybe contrary to the mm-hmm. message of the narrative. And I think that's what a lot of people felt with the with the animals, that there was ludonarrative dissonance, that it was a lot of Cal coming to peace with nature, peace with himself, and like, yes, we are all connected. I got to go kill three, three to 10 frog guys, you know, is yeah. it, it, there's this dissonance there. And it feels like this, uh, this story, this theme is set up to at least maybe acknowledge that sort of ludonarrative dissonance of mm-hmm. 
the truth is we as players, ew, we want to force push uh, Imperials off of tall things. <laughs> yes. But then it also wants to wrestle with, yep, we're doing that for fun, for escapism, for the fantasy of power. But for the character, w- what is an endless life of slashing Imperials mean is a way to address that Ludo narrative dissonance. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm. I that's some great stuff. I, I love that. It reminds me of why I love a lot of Battlefront too, and and maybe wasn't as connected to to Fallen Order and and and. But then give it time. Give these stories time. Give the creators uh, time to tell their entire story. And this is, seems to be what's going on here. We'll be addressing it. And I love the end game. It's not unlike to me some of the stuff that's um, we just saw in this last episode of Bad Batch, the the Pabu episode, right? Of just uh, of the why we fight, who we're fighting for, and and, and your place in it, right? Versus, mm-hmm easily you can become overwhelmed consumed by it and and this this jedi character we're talking about here there are jedi i don't know adjacent to high republic where and by the way I, some people I, I like your thought joseph too i've heard this before some people are saying hey maybe he has emerged from the high republic area era um age wise could have been there or some other you know who knows a frozen caveman lawyer pops up again i don't know but <laughs> i also like the idea of someone who maybe was a jedi maybe survived order 66 that whole stuff and then kind of identifies wants to represent what they feel is the jedi legacy going back to high republic stuff because that's kind of uh, what's at stake in the game at least in some of the descriptions right as cal must preserve the jedi legacy is some of the things i've seen some of the slug lines mm. out there like cool but what is that right and having this person can be consumed by the fire terrorizing frog guys there you <laughs> start. and 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 kind of this big wayne what are the jedi supposed to be particularly in this era where you got one out in the desert you got one you know a, a drinking cowboy waiting to find Hera. like you got all you got all these jedi all about and who knows what quinlan boss is doing mm-hmm. um but they got to find their spot and i love that that's a big thing big mm-hmm. thing Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm very intrigued to see where they're going with that. With that uh, High Republic, I, there's, I'm so torn between. Do, do I want somebody who has right. been in hiding and emerged to be like, I I took a hundred years break because I lived for four hundred years, and what did you do? Versus somebody who's like, uh, we failed, so I'm going to put on the the clothes that remind me of not failure. Mm. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, it's like their favorite sports team, the High Repair, Republic Air Jedi. Uh, I'm gonna I have put on the jersey of the '92 Lakers, and this will not stand. <laughs> not stand. How could you lose to the Empire? How could you lose Jen, anything? Jump out to you, theme wise. I, you know, it really is fascinating because I, I think about how many people want to see this in live action. They want to see Cal in live action. And the way that you guys are talking about this story, there is a lot there. And it, you know, obviously with the success of The Last of Us, it makes me think that we could very Mm -hmm. well see Mm -hmm. this in live action, which then makes me wonder, are we going to see a continuation of the story from when this game Mm -hmm. ends? Or will they recreate what has been done within this game? Um, I don't know, but I I see the actor and I forget his name at the moment, but I I see him and I was like, oh my gosh, like Mm -hmm. he's ready. (laughs) Get get him in there, get him on a set. And uh, so why not, right? But it certainly is something that they could do pretty, it's it's already been written, so to speak. So uh, Yeah. yeah, but I mean, that's a testament to the power of this game that it isn't just, you know, Cool, cool. Let's let's battle the bad guys, right? It, there is a a deep storyline traveling throughout. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Cameron Monahan, uh, the Thank wonderful you, yes. performer, doing it. You, uh, you, Joseph, I'll let you jump in there. You, Jen, mm-hmm. you just got to be really excited about something because yes, there's a push to have Cal show up or the thoughts of Cal, and I've 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 that's been lukewarm for me, not just because of the game. I'm like, eh, I don't know, we'll see. But just I haven't watched The Last of Us, but going back to tell the story in live action. That, that is more intri- intriguing to me than I ever thought. That'd be cool. I could be on board. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, all these actors, uh, Tina uh, Ivlev, uh, apologize if I'm uh, pronouncing it incorrectly, uh, plays Marin, right? And it's all this sort of motion capture stuff that is very, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, <laughs> when I was uh, Googling Cal Kestis, one of the questions was, oh, who is the face actor for Cal Kestis? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, they do play the character. <laughs> It's true. Uh, yeah, I, I watched Last of Us, really enjoyed it. I had not played the video game, so then it, it was really interesting to see what was very faithful to the video game versus what was expanded from the video game, and that might be really interesting uh, mm. to do a story that's like, 
we're going to, uh, you know, adapt this, which doesn't mean like change a bunch of stuff, but maybe we're going to emphasize this, you know, scene, or maybe we need to see more of Marin's life uh, before Cal shows up. So we're going to do a, an episode of that or that, mm. that kind of thing, which is what it, it appears that Last of Us mostly did is mostly expand things. Yes. Mm, intriguing. Intriguing. I like that. I like that. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Any, anything else on the table there, Jen? I didn't want to. No, no, that because uh, I I I learned so much from you, Joseph, about the scene. That was great. That was great. It's uh, yeah, no, there's a lot there. There's a lot in this trailer, and and I wanted to talk about some of the gameplay. Again, I know this wasn't the gameplay trailer that was kind of earlier, but you see little um, little thoughts, and this is where again I I try to be as honest as I can. I, I like I saw some of it, and I just I I get that like. Uh, here we go again. I just got to smash some buttons. I got to solve a puzzle that will frustrate me. So I'm a dumb dumb. And I just want to hear the story. So maybe I'm just now, I just want this to be a TV series. Maybe I just have to own that. <laughs> and, then let, and speaking to what I said up at the top of the show, got to let people enjoy this. And I do. I, I poke some time every, every now and then, but I got to even stop that because sometimes the poking can seem too real if, if I just keep going with it. I just got, I just got to enjoy this story as best the way I can. Put it on easy. Just hack and slash through it, and I'll enjoy a good Star Wars story. Yeah, what is there, the narrative mode these days yeah. that um, that is really designed for, like, I don't need to be super challenged. That's not why I'm playing. I, I want to play through the story. Yeah, um, yeah and I still have no idea uh, how I'm going to approach this game. I do not have a PlayStation 5. <laughs> it seems like that's like a, a part-time job still to find a PlayStation mm -hmm. 5, much less to purchase one. And then th there's still just like, huge beasts right that just that look like a a video game console has has is cosplaying count dracula right <laughs> like mm -hmm. uh so mm -hmm. uh, it's it's like it's this very weird like i would like to play this game i have to redo my living room to make room for this beast if i can even find one is yeah. uh for me a, a a frustrating um i understand you got to move to the future that's the way it goes but it's really frustrating that i can't just i don't care i don't care if the graphics are a uh, gold nine 64 level uh, personally i really I, I i know that's an absolute priority for a lot of gamers and i totally respect that i don't give a damn i wish i could just buy a, a, a version for the playstation 4 yeah <laughs> yeah no i get yeah no I, I get it eventually yeah it all moves on but i i remember i remember I got a PlayStation 4 pretty late in the game because I was holding on to my three. Like, no, I'm good. <laughs> but, but to your point, uh, yeah, um, yeah, respect the, the gaming of it all. But uh, yeah, it, uh, it, it's not that I don't think there should be new consoles and that yeah. things should move on. And I, this would this should be fine for me for the next 20 years. I, to mm -hmm. me, it's just there's so much Star Wars going on and I'd really like to play this game. And it, it's really hard to make time for that sort of infrastructure change yeah. In, yeah. in my life. It's a total personal thing, not a we shouldn't move yeah. on. Mm -hmm. yeah no indeed no and 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 it, it's gonna be you know uh it, I'm, I'm sure it might have been a tough decision i'd love to know some of the you know workings behind that uh not just this game but any game that's like all right this is this is one that's only going forward um but yeah th th there's uh you know that's you know <laughs> you know when a lot of people can't play the game uh and there's going to be more people that can't play the game right it's not just uh, a couple small few yeah, it makes perfect business sense because, yeah. you know, this game is has a good likelihood of making me buy a PlayStation yeah. 5. <laughs> yeah. It's done yep. its job. Yep. It's, yep. Good job, everybody. Good job. <laughs> uh, I love it there. So, Jen, have you have you tracked down a PlayStation 5 yet? Or do you, do you, have you forged through the wilderness to find one? No. And and <laughs> I, there was an opportunity where I, I could have gotten one. I was like, we're, we're fine with our PS4. Um, and now I'm like, shoot, we should have gotten it. But I've been having fun playing uh, Zelda. What was it? Breath of the mm -hmm. Wild. Mm -hmm. And we've been playing that every night. And it's so it's kind of relaxing in some sense, even though there's obviously some creatures that you need to battle and stuff like that. But it, it it's nice. And you do the puzzles. And it's it's a nice way to kind of wind down at the end of the night exploring the world. This game definitely does not seem as relaxing. I think even <laughs> if, even in the creative mode or narrative mode or whatever, I think it's just there was so much action. I was like, oh, man, I'm going to have to play this one in the morning if I can find a PS5. <laughs> Uh, I got lucky. I Someone sent me a link and I did that whole like, though, this is going to destroy every computer I own. This link yeah. is going to just take my identity and it ended up working. And it, it, it's, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's frustrating. It, it's, it's, uh, you can't just go down to the local store and buy it. Uh, I get it. I get yeah. it. Yeah. 
the actual gameplay looks fun. Once I master lightsaber stuff and force mm. moves, man, there's I, so much fun to do. There was one thing where like there was a rope, and I was like, I hope that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to learn ropes. Yeah, yeah, and, and I've seen this out there too. And again, you all can even maybe poke fun at us. I get we don't play. We don't. We're not totally steep. I don't have Nintendo Power subscriptions anymore. Okay, I don't know every little video game um, bit of information out there, but. Uh, I, I want this game to start with the skills I learned in the first game, and then I'll learn new ones. Because mm. so much of the first game was learning how to force jump and learning how to, and I learned them. Unless Cal Kessis got a bonk on the head, I better have those skills. <laughs> I better be there. there. Yeah, there is that sort of comic uh, acceleration of your skills. Like uh, if you go to planets in the wrong order and the first one is like, well, there's clearly something I have to do up there, but I can't jump that high yet. Well, I'll come back after I've learned some life lessons. Like no matter how <laughs> elegant the storytelling gets, it, there's always going to be to me a sort of fun tension with the mechanics of a game as well. Of like, I'll come back after I've got the jumping instruction. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, look, yeah, I, I'm with you. Uh, even in uh, the this Lego Skywalker saga or any of the Lego games, you, you come to a, a port or something, you're like, oh, well, haven't got R2 yet. I got to. I'll come back. There. <laughs> exactly. Uh-huh. Well, there's our, our thoughts there on Star Wars Jedi Survivor. Of course, the game comes out now late April, I think April 28th. It is the official uh, sponsor, one of the official sponsors of Star Wars Celebration. So synergy there. I'm sure we'll get more information and there'll be a lot going on there. Um, maybe there's some raffle or something and you can uh, win a PlayStation and a game and uh, fly on back with Joseph and Jennifer. We'll, we'll get you. We'll get you hooked up over there. Um so there we go. We're going to take a quick break. But before we do, Everforce Center recommends an audiobook we think you should try out on us. And then on the other side, Dave Filoni and Damon Lindelof speaking in interviews. And we're going to talk about it here. Uh, so, uh, Joseph, what do we have for Force Center recommends? We are recommending the book we were just talking about, Battle Scars by Sam Meggs. Uh, we are excited about Phase 2 of the High Republic, but uh, we have fallen behind. So we will... Uh, we will read them at some point. We will cover them in some way, but we are heading toward a wanting to check out Battle Scars. We are clearly invested in this world, these characters, so we can't wait to read it. And if you want to get an audiobook, uh, so you are all caught up as well, here's a way to do that. Yeah, you can go to uh, download your free audiobook today by going to audibletrial.com slash force center. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash force center for your free audiobook. It truly does help out the show. All right, quick break on the other side. News with Floney and Lindelof. Stick around for more. Welcome back to Force Center. We're taking a look at the news, breaking news from a long time ago. And we got a couple of big interviews here we want to talk about. And Dave Filoni was speaking with, who was he speaking with? Oh, the rap. He was speaking with the rap. And uh, Star Wars fans, when Dave Filoni speaks, Star Wars fans listen or at least start to fight. And sometimes I will admit I see it and I move on from it. I just don't even read the interviews because now that I don't like the man in the cowboy hat. I'm just like, I don't even know. what he, I don't just just give me Sabine. I know she's going to be there. Um, <laughs> that's trying. I'm trying to work through my uh, pessimistic view of Star Wars. <laughs> uh, but the big headline from this interview is the big climactic story event. All caps talk. As we all know, uh, Kathleen Kennedy spoke about this back in uh, what, 2020, Investor Day. It was a sentence or two. Um, but we had a reason to believe because it was said in an official capacity. Uh, this seemed to be countered a bit recently. That's kind of maybe my own thoughts on that uh, by John Favreau and his thoughts on the Mando series and the potential to just go and go and go. I'll go. I'll do eight seasons, 10 seasons. It doesn't have to end. And I think maybe some people thought, well, wait, I thought this uh, this and Skeleton Crew and all these shows, Ahsoka, maybe all lead to this big climactic story event. So Dave answered this pretty simply. I'm summarizing this. We'll dive into the details. Why can't you have both? Uh, citing his own whiteboards with the Star Wars timeline on them, Dave seemed to make clear clear that there is room for a big event involving not just the shows out there now and those coming in this section of the Star Wars timeline, but an event key to this entire era of the Star Wars storytelling beyond just these shows. Um, so let's stop right there. Thoughts on uh, the big climactic story event of it all. Jen, where are you with this and some of his comments? I, I love when Dave speaks, but I too, I'm just like, oh, okay, I don't know if I can get into this discourse right now. But this one was really <laughs> interesting. And I like that he had his own whiteboard with a timeline because I too have my Star Wars timeline, not on a whiteboard, uh-huh. on a TV 
piece of paper oh. so, I can, yeah. so I can keep track of everything. Um, and initially I thought, and I think we had talked about this a few weeks ago, where I was like, ooh, it could be an Avenger style team up. But the way that he hmm. presented it doesn't really sound like that. And then it got me thinking about the books, which I have not finished Bloodline. I'm still reading it. Um, and obviously, Aftermath. There's so much that happens be between, you know, uh, Return of the Jedi and uh, The Force Awakens, right? Mm -hmm. So much time. And I was like, oh, man, what could what could the big event be? It could be so many different things. You know, the, the First Order. Could it be Snow? Could it be Leia coming into power? And I'll defer to you guys on that because I know that you guys have read all those books. What am I missing in those books there has to be something really really big right am i missing something oh uh, no i don't think so i think that's kind of the the point um mm. is that there uh, are books in, in it, this is so much the conversation that's going on with this most recent episode of the mandalorian that it is picking mm -hmm. up on on lots of the threads of various uh political realities kind of near Return of the Jedi in the aftermath of the Galactic Civil War. And then with the the one novel Bloodline, really a little bit of a picture of kind of how the New Republic turned out and a little bit of how the First Order is. Uh, they're not rising to beat the challenge of that. Um, not a ton of clarity in that. I, I, so I kind of think what this, this is a, about is right now there have been a couple of books kind of poking around in this timeline. But other than that, it's open. Mm. Yeah. And I think what when Filoni is talking about a, a big event, I think it, he's saying that, that that there's room to create a big event uh, yeah. that hadn't existed before. Mm, um, I see. Yeah. So I think that's the big thing. And there's like there's some general things to tie into is you, you go into uh, the Force Awakens era and if you want to match up with Bloodline, but nothing that's holding you back from doing massive galactic events. Yeah. Hmm. That whiteboard is wide open, it would seem. It would seem. Yeah. 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 Joseph, your, your thoughts on some of this too? Yeah. I think, uh, I think the, oh, the confusion, uh, is just the one word climactic, right? If you, mm -hmm. if you take out, uh, the, the word climactic from big climactic story event, you have big story event, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that totally understandable for us, uh, uh as an audience to hear, you know, a presentation from Kathleen Kennedy about television shows, right? Of we've got the Mandalorian. Now we're announcing Ahsoka at the time. There was going to be the, the, um, you know, the something of the new Republic, <laughs> the Rangers, yeah, Rangers, oh, yeah. right, right. Rangers, of the new Republic. And now that's not there, but skeleton crew is. And I think we were hearing this, digesting this, talking about this is some television shows are going to build up to a crossover. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the way Filoni is talking about this, which makes perfect sense, because I think it's the way he's often talked. It's a very Lucas way to talk is, um, no, there's going to be a big event that happens in the galaxy mm -hmm. and the characters will be affected by it. And functionally, that might look like a crossover, <laughs> but that's not the way we're thinking about that, about right. it. You know, mm -hmm. they're thinking about it as a story. And I think. For me, that's really interesting, and, and, it, and it explains, you know, this conversation that's been going back and forth with the interviews with Favreau of people being like, well, I thought it was all going to build up to this big event, and that was going to be the end of the Mandoverse. Mm -hmm. And I think what's being said now is um, there's going to be a big galactic event that affects a lot of the characters, and maybe that big galactic event will be the end of Jude Law's character right. <laughs> from right. Skeleton Crew. Maybe it, that will, you know, be when Ahsoka and Ezra go off to M Mortis, uh, if, yeah. if that is what happens. But for Din, it might be, and this big galactic event ends with New Mandalore, and, and, and mm -hmm. Din is the leader. And mm -hmm. Din's story could go on from there. Now, what adventures does he have as the new leader of Mandalore? I think that's a little bit m more what the way I'm reading what Filoni is saying. Yeah, no, and and I, I agree with you because it, it, it's got me more excited for this. Again, saying up top, if I just kind of glossed over some of these stories, anytime they pop up, um, I think because going even back to, to Kathleen Kennedy saying that, I, I, I had I was in the mindset that you're talking about of like, all right. We got three or four shows and we're going to, you know, it's the TV movie of the week. They're all going to cross over and, and, and yay. And I, I think I didn't look at it uh, as big as, as they are, which is again, why I love that they're the ones with the whiteboards and not me of uh, something to this era. I love that they're pulling in a lot of the themes or some of the stuff going on with the government, but I still don't necessarily mean, or think that means 
uh, that it that I don't know that that that, that it, it's going to provide the big answers that a lot of people want for Exegol, Palpatine, all that kind of stuff. I, I think some mm-hmm. of the stuff you and I talked about recently, Joseph, of Moff Gideon still being a big bad for himself, and that there's other things, and that Palpatine or even the spirit of Palpatine is going to do it's going to do cool you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll take what you've been doing for yourself, and, and we'll use it for ourselves. Uh, but yeah, so I, 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 I'm ready to be surprised by what this could be. Maybe this is just me being hopeful that I don't want it to be Thrawn, Yuzon Vong, anything like that. I, Thrawn's obviously going to be out there. You know what I mean? But like that, that's it's not that. That Thrawn tries to take over the galaxy and defeat it. That it, that it's something different, something that's tied into them- thematically to some of the stuff going on. You mentioned the Mandalore stuff. We're not done talking about that. I'm, I'm sure here, but. Yeah, that 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 guy that has me more excited to be going. Hey, we got this big whiteboard of timeline. Here's this one, and what can happen here that affects these characters is a great way to look at it for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and then it gets really exciting because it isn't you know just answering questions. It isn't just um, yeah. quote unquote fixing the sequel trilogy for people who who, who didn't like it. Um, <laughs> I, I don't like that term myself uh, it is uh, I don't think the Clone Wars fixed the prequels. I think that they added uh, lots of rich context. Um, mm-hmm. But if it isn't sort of like our first order explainer, I mean, I think we might deal with some of that first order. How much does the galaxy know? When did they know it eventually? But it becomes really interesting of like, if this is the Thrawn conflict, which a lot of people have been really excited this week, thinking that, you know, it's Thrawn who destroyed Bo-Katan's home. Who knows? We'll see all that. But what's exciting to me is if the big event is a, is the Chiss conflict, you know, what is Thrawn's motivation? You know, he's, you know, he's not always just been like super pro imperial. <laughs> what does he want? You know, uh, did he break and just wants, uh, uh, you know, revenge? Is he trying to take over a system for the Chiss or is it not Thrawn at all? Is it is there a full out new Mandalorian war that the New Republic tries to insert itself into? There's a lot of exciting possibilities, which for what this event could be. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Jen, uh, any thoughts on who bombed? Bo-Katan's home. Yeah, I saw a lot of people excited about uh, it being potentially Thrawn. But I think you're right Mm -hmm. about – I'm just going to let the creators do what they do. And I'm sure I will be surprised because never would I have ever imagined that they would bring in a baby Yoda, Grogu, Mm -hmm. into this series. I never would have imagined that. And that it would be not only just successful but like a mega hit, right? It totally changed the game. So I give them uh, the utmost control and I just want to be entertained and show me what you got. Show me what you got indeed. Um, And we're talking about characters, uh, Thrawn and Sabine and uh, other characters that appeared in uh, other Star Wars uh, programming, those animated shows. And Dave was asked about trying to get his, and I'm quoting here, cartoon characters into shows. (laughs) (laughs) And he responded that is not a priority for him, whether people believe him or not. He also discussed the differences between animated and live action versions. Um, and how that can factor into the decision of who to use and the actor to play them in terms of who to use the characters, the actors to play them. And, and he says uh, more on the way. This we know. Uh, and thoughts on uh, we have some thoughts on this response here. Uh, I just I just I do like that part of Dave a lot where he's like, I'm telling you this and no one's going to believe me. But also <laughs> yeah. I think he has fun with that as well. So uh, anyways, uh, Joseph, your thoughts on this response to this question that keeps coming up about them cartoon characters. And does any of this uh, change your expectations for any characters uh, to make the jump? No, I mean, I, I really like that. I, I feel like, you know, Filoni in particular really does uh, know the the way fandom discourse can go. And uh, he continues, and, and Favreau as well, to talk about it from a story first perspective. He gives a great example of we needed a gunslinger for a book of Boba Fett and mm-hmm. Cad Bane made a lot of sense. So we thought about, can we pull that off? How will it work? And that's mm-hmm. how that happened. So the idea that, you know, it, it isn't saying, I want to use these characters. Now, what story can I make with these characters? But it's more, I we are telling this story and we need a character that fits this mold. That character already exists in animation and they're not locked in animation anymore. We're locked in books, uh, mm-hmm. if that character makes sense. So I, I love him arguing for that perspective. So I think he's kind of doing that with the Cad Bane example. <laughs> and, then, and then he's like, you know, at the same time, I mean, like there are a lot of characters that I've worked with a lot that I that I know and I really like. And I just feel like, yeah, the, the Ahsoka show is obviously a Ahsoka show, but also a continuation of Rebels. It's a sequel to a story he he told one chapter of. And now he's like, I'm not jamming, 
quote unquote cartoon characters. Mm-hmm. I'm this is the next chapter of that story <laughs> that I was was telling, you know. Mm-hmm. Um and then for characters showing up, you know, that's that's fascinating because we're we're at this, you know, weird mix right now with if this is the next chapter in the saga of of rebels uh in the ahsoka show mm-hmm. sabine is confirmed cast you know been on panels right uh chopper yeah. chopper is confirmed been rolling around on panels uh <laughs> we, we saw the back of Hera's head right thrawn and ezra seem are not officially announced but seem very very likely right yeah mm-hmm. uh so then you start to get to 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 think about how freakish is a live action Zeb going to look? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, wow. Will Will Kalis be uh, as hot in live action? <laughs> uh, <laughs> is there a, a, a vision? And I know people are discussing this of communion with Kanan. Mm-hmm. There, there are a lot of Rebels characters who are like, yep, they're either announced or or seem extremely likely, which then I think turns focus to the to the rest of them. And then and then you go beyond that and you're like, how many heavy hitters from animation are left? You know, mm-hmm. uh, right. which builds us all to just Hondo watch. We're just on Hondo watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Hondo watch indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So th- those are some of my thoughts about who could show up and mm-hmm. and why. Right. Uh, yeah, uh, and and pitch it to to you here, Jen, in a second. But I, one of the things I love of what you're saying there, Jen, uh, Joseph, um, all these names. Is, um, <laughs> is is what Dave is uh, the, the slight perspective switch, right? There's so many there. Uh, Kanan, we're going to get Kanan's thoughts in a second. It's, it's just a perspective switch that either you believe or you don't. Mm. Like that Dave's like, yeah, I don't have my trading cards and I'm just like throwing them on the, John, can we use this? Can we use this? Can we use this? That it does, you know, I believe the Cad Bane one. Just like I believe the, hey, you know, we didn't think Luke would be in the series, but it just started to make more sense as we're telling the story. And you're playing with the era. This goes, even goes back to that big uh, event. You're in the era. What can you do? And some things are a little difficult. You know, I, I, you know, I, I was, for, I held my breath for about a second in this last episode of Mando because I thought, are they gonna, are they gonna cut to Leia mm. in the Galaxy's Opera House? Could they do that? Are they gonna cut to Mon Mothma? They could do that. You know, and, and I do want some of that stuff. Maybe um, I'm not saying I want to. A, a, a CG Leia yet? Don't anyone throw anything at me? Uh, but maybe I'd be open to it. Um, yeah, and it just—I don't know. I'm just excited for uh, the right characters at the right time. And of course, like you said, uh, the, the big heavy hitters that are there are going to be moved on because he's—he's—he's he's, he's getting a chance to tell that story. Um, and I love that there. Um, and then, and, and my explanations on on casting and and who—it's like it's it's the. Ashley Eckstein versus Rosario Dawson. It's Katie Sackhoff slides into a role she played. And, uh, you know, Favreau for a while, at least the voice of. He's not doing the voice anymore of past. But uh, there's rumors going around of other characters, Fenra and stuff, some of that stuff. And some of the actors might be more right for it than others. And and, and that changes a little bit my expectations of who might show up or who they might need to find or want to find and change things. Um because it is different to play them. Not that these uh, actors, the voice actors, aren't actors themselves, and it's kind of one and the same. They're different skill sets, but uh, they are performers. So, and anyways, that, that just got me thinking about who might show up as well. So, Jen, a whole bunch of stuff on the table. I think that's your name. What do you think? <laughs> yes, it is me. Um, you know, I, I really think that the biggest, <laughs> the biggest thing that people are, are hung up on is like quote unquote cartoon characters, and I don't know if the interviewer said that jokingly or if they actually really meant that. Um, and I think that for, for Dave yes. and, and all of them, they really just think of them as, as characters, which he stated. And it, it is about the story. Like you guys are saying, who is right for this story? And you have all these characters and all these different threads you know, it made sense to bring Cad Bane in when they did. And I, I really like that he shared how he is, they consider a lot, how are they going to look? Who is going to portray them? There's so much thought into bringing these characters from animation into live action. They know that it it is a risk. They know that there's a lot of fans who love, like, I mean, Freddie Prince Jr., like, he, Mm -hmm. we know him from live action. It would make sense to me that he would play Kanan, but what if they bring in Kanan and they have another actor portraying him, right? There's all these things to consider, and they are absolutely thinking about that. Um, Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was great that he shared that. They're, They're not... Yes, they're having fun, right? They're uh, mm-hmm. like they've talked about pl- kids, kids in the sandbox pl- playing with their toys, or whatever. They're being very deliberate. They are storytellers, and they're being um, particular about who they bring in for these storylines. Yeah, yes, indeed. And uh, maybe at this point, Freddie might be in uh, 
Detention? I don't know. <laughs> Stop going on podcast, Freddie. Right. There you go. There you go. Yeah. I, I, the big character that I'm hopeful for is, uh, is the Bendu. Uh, Ooh. I love the character, the Bendu, uh, clearly will be played by a, the largest Muppet ever built, I think, <laughs> yes. uh, in still voiced by Tom Baker while he's still with us, please. Yes. I, I, look, I, I'd be fascinated to see that. It, it, and, 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 and for Mando, I don't, I'm not, I don't know about the Ahsoka series. I imagine it, it's going to be the same vibe, but does, the Bendu just appearing in, in Mando as wild as that might, that just kind of goes with the vibes of some of the creatures and characters we see before. Like they could probably pull it off. Oh yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Ooh, could Mando, or excuse me, could Bendo, Bendo, ben, Bendo in Mando, <laughs> <laughs> Bendo in Mando be just part of like the stagecraft? Could they, could they do that? Could it be the first ever stagecraft character? Oh yeah, just on the video Ooh. screen. Yeah, video screen. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm pushing it there. Uh, at the top of the interview, going to the top of the interview, Dave addressed the core of the Mandalorian story being very much about being Mandalorian, both for Din and Grogu, and as well as Bo-Katan and the culture itself. This is a lot of stuff we're seeing in season three already. Again, well, nothing new or too surprising. Does that make us think anything new or old about the coming season and the future of the show? And this kind of, oh, I'm not gonna lie, is is that. Moff Gideon conversation you and I were having, Joseph, on the review about him and his relationship to Mandalore being part of the story, not him and his relationship to Snoke clones and Palpatine, which might be there, but might not be the focus. So anyway, mm-hmm. um, Joseph, your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I'm really intrigued by that. I haven't had a chance to to deep dive into like some of the great videos analyzing the mm-hmm. Thrawn of it all. I think, you know, people are really taking uh, uh, Bo Katan's comment about like that's too many imperials for for a warlord to me i i took that as moff's gideon's got more uh, up his sleeve than we thought uh, mm-hmm. other people were really reading that as thrawn but to me it seems like moff gideon's a petty petty man <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> who's gonna blow up a castle in vengeance so i'm really excited to see uh, where all that storytelling goes but but to this specific thing about it's about mandalore you're right it relates because i think moff gideon's got an obsession with mandalore and he has a reason to want to keep them under his boot to prove that he is the most powerful and he beat them. Mm -hmm. Um, But I was really excited about this particular quote from Dave Filoni, uh, where he says uh, that, hey, it's about Mandu and Grogu, but they've pulled into their orbit many other Mandalorian characters, namely Katie Sackhoff's Bo-Katan, you have the armor. And I think it starts to raise a lot of questions about the way and what is the way? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm I'm not going to say it in case other people have missed it and don't want to know. Um... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but but Carl Weathers it was c- c- cooking up some internet uh, stew by just dropping the name in the next episode of The Mandalorian, right? Um, and, and we got a shout. Our, our four center listener Mark Knope tweeted about it, and Carl Weathers responded to him and said, "Oh, I'm so sorry." <laughs> oh, really? Be peace. Oh. I think it's one of those like, oh, did, oh, is that a secret? I, oh, sorry, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, it, yeah. between that that title. And this quote, I feel like we're finally going to get into the meat of questioning what is the way from the perspective of Mm -hmm. the children of the watch. And I I, I feel kind of strongly about that because I, I love the the storytelling that's been going on in the Mandalorian where we've been we've been learning things bits and pieces. Din has been asked to question this a little bit, question that a little bit. He he made this big choice of taking off the helmet to share this this moment of connection and, and intimacy uh, mm-hmm. with Grogu, but then slapped it right back on, right? Yeah. Um, we ended the last episode with, Din is there. He's back in. Grogu's mm-hmm. ready to learn the way. Uh, <laughs> Bo-Katan's ready to uh, be a part of the way or not, or mm-hmm. use them, all that stuff. Anyway, my, my point being, uh, I love nuance. I love seeing other characters' perspectives. Um I love seeing, you know, the world and individual is individuals is, you know, complicated and multifaceted beings. But there is also this history in Star Wars of being morality tale where everything is complex. There are gray gray areas, but you get to a point where the story of Star Wars is defined by specific characters, ultimate choices. Mm -hmm. And I feel at some point I want Din to confront what the way truly is and say, yep, it's got good things. It's got some bad things I wasn't aware of. What is my decision? Is this the right place for my child? At some point, Din has to 
address in I think we the audience. I think like some of us who who've spent more time with Death Watch in in uh, the Clone Wars are more opinionated about it because we've we've yes. watched Bo Katan personally terrorize utterly innocent villagers. Horrific stuff. Um, and the if you're just watching the Mandalorian, I don't think you fully get how uh, awful mm-hmm. some of the children of the Watch's beliefs might be. And I'm really eager to just splash that on the big screen and force Din to make a choice. Yeah, I like that's the the whole series. Make a choice, man. <laughs> make a choice. Um, it's, but it just all, it all just makes sense from where we go back to where we first meet him. When we walk walks in, and he's very much the way, but he's kind of lost and and refined. It's just just I'm intrigued by what Dave was saying. This was actually my favorite part of the interview, when I wanted to to talk about it last. It's just uh, what's at stake and what's actually being talked about in these episodes. There's big galaxy ramifications and connections and all that. And I love getting excited for that. I'm never going to, uh, I watch those videos, right? Not just, mm-hmm. I love Alex and Molly stuff. I watch other videos too. And Star Wars seven by seven, a lot of that stuff are just people speculating and, and, and we love it. That's why we have the shirt, but we, it's not just about responsible, respons- responsible for speculation. It's about finding out what is actually there, what's actually being communicated. And it's all about, like you're saying, what is the way and choose the way. And what is good from here, bad from here, but what is right for you and what choice you got to make and uh, what do people, people want to control that way. People want to make it their own way or just uh, are full of revenge. I still think that's a lot of what's at play with Moff Gideon there. Jen, a lot of talk about the way, which is, uh, you know, a little catchphrase you've heard. (laughs) (laughs) Just a little one. You know, uh, after seeing Bo-Katan lose her home in this past episode, I really think that she is in a vulnerable position. Um, she just seems so kind of, I want to say beaten down, but she's been through a lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, and she's lost her sister, forces abandoned her, uh, you know, so she may be open to it. But then I think it's, you know, at some point she is who she is and I think she'll be tired of how, of their way, so to speak, and Mm -hmm. the armor. And I think that that's where things might come to a, a a head, which will be very interesting to see. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Were you affected by, you know, we we love turning to you uh, for your actual parental, uh, you know, experience that Ken and I don't have. <laughs> is it is it more powerful when, it, hey, Din, this has been Din's life and Din wants to go back to it, but he's choosing to introduce his child to yeah. it. Does that mm. affect you as a, as a parent? It means that he's, yeah, it means that that he is all in and that's what he thinks is the best. For Mm -hmm. both him and his child, which that is, that is interesting. And, and is that going to change? And is he going to reject that and be like, no, you know what? We don't want to do this. And I am going to take off my helmet. Uh, (laughs) I don't know. But yeah, that speaks to his state of mind that he believes that this is the right thing for, for him and for, for Grogu. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very exciting. Yeah. Exciting. Exciting, and, and and I want to I want um, like a lot of people want to know what's going on through Bo-Katan's head because the mask is on. So many ways to read it, which I love. I just mm-hmm. love. Mm-hmm. Hard to predict going forward. Well, that's a lot of the felony stuff. Any final thoughts there, uh, Joseph or Jennifer? Uh, no, I just I I I understand that a lot of times Filoni does an interview, and you know one thing will be kind of a, a, a headline discussed about the the climactic event. But I just I think a lot of times both Filoni and Favreau are, are are really playing fair, and they're telling you what's on their mind and why they're making choices. And I think it's good to dive into the actual um, depth of the article and, and what is truly being said. Uh, indeed. And so it's not just engaged with the art presented, but gauge with the interview answers presented. <laughs> what I think we should also add to our forced inner discussions and mantras there. Uh, quick one here. Are these the first public comments from Damon Lindelof about his Star Wars film? Quotations around his, because there's a lot of people involved. Let's dive in. I think so, is how I'll answer that question. While speaking with Slash Film, Damon Lindelof was asked about what it's like to create something in the Star Wars galaxy. There's a lot to the uh, that section of the interview, but I pulled, pulled out his answer. He said, I will just say for reasons that I can't get into on this Sunday morning, on this day, the degree of difficulty is extremely, extremely, extremely high. If it can't be great, it shouldn't exist. That's all I'll say because I have the same association with it as you do, which is it's the first movie I saw sitting on my dad's lap, four years old, May of 77. I think it's possible that sometimes when you get Hold on to something in such a hold something in such high reverence and esteem. You start to get in the kitchen and you just go, maybe I shouldn't be cooking. Maybe I should just be eating. 
But we'll just leave it at that point. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot to that interview. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. And the interview, uh, interview rides got added. I think you said something about similar before uh, a, a, a Watchmen, but you absolutely pulled that off. And Lind Lindelof responded with the hair of my chinny chin chin. So uh, a lot there, uh, Jen. I'll start with you here on uh, you know uh, the, one of the men, uh, one of the voices, the, the minds behind Lost. Uh, the hot take. Do you have any hot takes on Lost before you get into this? <laughs> I don't have any hot takes. I didn't really watch the show but i knew that the what was the, the, the i don't anyways i yeah i just remember there was a lot of a lot of drama around that and the different reveals and stuff mm -hmm. um i thought that this was a very candid interview and i thought that the interviewer did a really great job of phrasing this question to get a truthful answer and a kind of a vulnerable answer and it just shows to uh, the level of respect that he has for Star Wars and the the humongous task that he has because Lucasfilm is being so uh concerned and, and rightfully so with making it right in the you know th theatrical yeah. releases the film side of things they're knocking it out of the park with Disney plus shows now they're trying to make it right for films and they want it to be perfect. And I think that he feels that pressure and he wants it to be for perfect because he's a great storyteller and he's also a fan himself. So I thought that I thought that they got and got him in a moment where he just is like in the trenches right now in the thick of this. Mm -hmm. And it, well, it reminds me of the stakes of not just Star Wars, but any of these big uh, franchises and IPs and, and with these big fans behind it. Of, of yes. this, if it's, it's got to be great, or it shouldn't exist. And, Man, that's that's the highest of the high standards, right? And <laughs> and that that's a lot of pressure. And I felt that. And it also speaks to like, you know, especially, you know, some of the recent comments of Iger, the film stuff of we gotta get it right. Like it it it's not you can take it as if you want as comments on anything that's come before, but I just think Lucasfilm, a lot of these studios again are just not in the position to be like, eh, let's try, let's yeah. try something. With the film, they they've got to get <laughs> it right, and they know that. Um, so a lot there. I love I love this too. I, I the kitchen stuff. I get, I get that, but also I, I wonder too, it's like, I, 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 I listened, uh, read that part of the interview, I should say. And, and uh, it's like, well, yeah, he's not alone. He's not, he's, he's brought some great cooks into the kitchen with him. Um, mm -hmm. Too many cooks, but um, that's, <laughs> like, that's, how, that's a good way to do it, Joseph, I think. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think that that is the way he approached Watchmen. And I think it's clearly, if all of the reports that we have read are true, that's the way he's approaching this. I have a kind of big picture idea. I will shepherd it, but I need all these other uh, creative forces to really be in the kitchen with me. Um, yeah, I, I was affected by the actual answer. I was affected by the fact that he he that he gave an answer and didn't just say, I, I can neither report nor deny anything Star Wars. Like he, he could have just evaded it entirely, right? Yeah. Um, but he he did choose to lean in. And, and it, it, to me, it confirmed that he's working on something, that all those reports have been true, uh, that he's, you know, working on something Star Wars. Um, the maybe I shouldn't be cooking, maybe I should just be eating quote um, is, uh, you know, for, for me, I, I, it's totally relatable, totally understandable. It's another way to say the the bar is high. Let's make sure this is right. All those great things. Um mm -hmm. My my hopeful reading of that is that he's stressed right now because he knows they're on the precipice of committing to something yeah. <laughs> with an announcement at celebration. Otherwise, this could be read as we're in development and we're we're still trying to decide whether to squeeze the trigger or not. Um, yeah. And if the if the the, the trigger is not uh, squozen <laughs> <laughs> on on this project, it's still going to be a while yet before Star Wars. Um, mm. Yeah. So I, I have some kind of thoughts about exactly what he said, but I wanted to respond to, you know, what what does this actually mean that he confirmed it? And and yeah. I hope that it means he's like, yep, yep, we're right on the precipice of making this announcement. And it sure is scary. Yeah, no, agree. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I consider this kind of a soft confirmation, not necessarily of the 2025 thing. But again, this was, you know, we always joke, we go to StarWars.com for official announcements. You know, uh, I used to say if, if Andy said it back in the day, now maybe Kristen Baver. If she says it, we know what's happening, right? Or if there's a panel. Uh, and and, and I, I think we get so swept up in, you know, getting variety, deadline, all these places reporting that, that yeah, you know, just to hear him go, oh, yeah, 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 that thing. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. I am at least working on it. <laughs> I have a whiteboard. <laughs> I have a whiteboard. <laughs> Jen, your, your thoughts on that uh, soft confirmation? And then we'll go uh, deeper. 
Yeah, you know, I actually it kind of sounded like it wasn't happening in, in that interview. But then uh, when the interviewer said, well, you know, you had something similar before Watchmen came out, then I was like, oh, actually, no, he just he's just like I said, he's in the trenches. Um, mm. So I I think it could be happening. Are they have enough yeah. time to figure it out. 2025, right? We're 2023. So yeah, there's there's time. There's hope. Is that what year this is? God, <laughs> I had to double check. My notes. Oh my gosh, I'm, we're very close to flying to London. Oh my god, time, 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 time. Wow. Uh, yeah, so uh, we go uh, deeper here on what he said. Joseph, uh, obviously, he's not going to give us uh, much more. And, and there's a little bit of that aw shucks card about trying to pull this off. And Watchmen's a great example for those who enjoy the series or, I don't know, learned about actual history through that series <laughs> as has been talked about before. Uh, what, do you, what do you take for this answer? Go ahead. Yeah, I really like what Jennifer said about liking the interviewer's question. And, and I think it, it's so important that this is a conversation, right? This is not a press release. This is a conversation that Lindelof is having with an interviewer. Mm. And uh, part of the way he answered might be the way the, the, um, the interviewer framed it. Because the interviewer mm -hmm. is the one who brought up this level of reverence, right? Um, mm -hmm. I wrote down what the interviewer actually asked him. Uh, they said, I, and I know you're not going to be able to say anything about it, but I always say that Star Wars is as close as I get to religion. I don't have memories that go back further than Star Wars. I'm not going to ask you about what your movie is about, but what is it like getting to craft something in that galaxy, particularly as you're not beholden to the Skywalker saga right now? What is that like? So, um, you know, we, we, we don't have the context of, you know, body language, tone of voice, of this seemed like a very friendly, very honest conversation. But I also think it's important that if we clip out just Lindos' response, that the interviewer basically said, <laughs> Star Wars is my religion. <laughs> yeah. uh, we are now conducting this interview in a glass house. Are you going to knock anything over? You know, yeah. are you going to shatter my walls? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, kudos uh, to both the interviewer for, for sharing their perspective and for Lindelof for acknowledging the reverence and sharing the reverence and in, in addressing that that's what was being talked about is the reverence part of it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Which, which led me to think that, you know, Lindelof is is being honest about the reverence. He's acknowledging the irreverence because that is true and that's a huge part of it. Um, but I think with with his work on on Watchmen as well, I, I think that Lindelof and team are very aware that you 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 have to be reverent and you can't just make a Star Wars to make a Star Wars, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it has to be a specific idea. It has to have approach. It has to have relevance, which means that classic Star Wars challenge of balancing the old but bringing something new or why are we doing this? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's interesting to me that, that he's talking about uh, reverence while also knowing like in order to have reverence for star Wars, which does love the old, but is always interested in the new, you know, lest we forget that lots and lots of people despise the prequels for being, bringing new ideas to star Wars, mm -hmm. knowing that I, I, Mm. You, you can't make a Star Wars movie for everyone. It's got to be new. It's got to be new. But then a lot of people aren't going to like that. Um, mm -hmm. So it it seems to me that he's almost um, <laughs> just uh, uh, twisting in that. I love the old, but I got to change some of it or there's no point in making it. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what's exciting to me is it's not just one person. It's got a team around him. And Lindelof has the chops to say, I love a thing. I'm going to burrow down into the thing and celebrate what I love while also bringing something new. That's what Watchmen was. Watchmen is a sacred text in comic books. Um, the, the, the writer, Alan Moore, is uh, famously grumpy, uh, despises adaptations, d despises the idea that this Lindelof punk <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is doing this. And, and Lindelof had had to give interviews and had to be in that place of like, Watchmen is one of the greatest things ever created. It's formative. I cannot resist playing in that world. I'm also sitting in the knowledge that the, the uh, creator of it does not think I should be doing this. Okay, here we go. So he's yeah. been in this position before where, you know, it, it, it is this torture test of it's it's got to be old and new. You, you got to bring new ideas. And, and I think for Watchmen, that's what made it sing. It wasn't just a faithful adaptation. It wasn't just a sort of like 20 years later, these characters are still around and they're still awesome. Mm -hmm. It was taking the idea of Watchmen and adding new ideas to the concept. 
Yeah, and, and your idea of you know otherwise why do it? Why why go forward? And and, and yeah, you're right about the you don't know the context or the tone of that uh, Skywalker saga comment. I, I think that can ruffle my feathers, but that's not fair of me to look at that. It just, it's a truth. Hey, you don't have that spine. Maybe um, we're going to different spots unless you count Ray Skywalker, according to rumors, right? According to lunch meetings. Uh, mm-hmm. But even then, you're you're going to new areas, uh, eras and areas of the story. So you a creator like him would not want to be like great. Let me just, um, you know, stick in this tiny little play box. You got to go to new spots. That's exciting. Yeah, That's, That's exciting. what I'm excited for. I mean, I, I want it to be new and different and I want it to, to celebrate what has come before, but also have a, a reason to exist. That's new. A reason to exist, Jen. A reason to exist. Any, any, any more thoughts there? Yeah, I, I think that it is. He's really having to thread thread the needle here, but you know, he has a proven track record that he knows what he's doing. And so I'm sure he will, he will figure it out. This is uh this might be a dark, dark time for him while they're going back and forth. Right. I mean, there's always Canon and there's characters and that's what the wonderful story group is for, you know, to bring, to help creators be able to tell the stories that they want to tell, but also still having it fit or, mm-hmm. you know, uh, connect with Star Wars canon that we know and that we obsess over. So I'm I'm excited. I'm excited. We have two years, and I'm sure that we'll get some breadcrumbs over these next two years. Mm. Or maybe a celebration. Maybe they'll announce something. Who knows? Yeah, we'll, we'll get a we'll get a lot of breadcrumbs. I think the next couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Uh, of, if it's not this, something else. I think. Uh, yeah. It, look, he's got to at least feel relieved. He's not having to uh, spat with George Lucas like he uh, had to. <laughs> with, um, I don't know more there, but uh, yeah, different vibe. But yeah, and, and I like, I don't know what you guys think. Again, we always joke that the, the, the Lindelof-lians, the Lindelof-led, his movie, there's so many people involved already. Oh, so many names out there. I kind of like that maybe he's a little bit of a shield. I'll go out. You guys go do the magic. Let's go do it. I'll, I'll answer these questions. It's precious. It's got to be great. And uh, I'm scared, but we got some talented people doing it. And don't bother them. They're working. Mm-hmm. That's right. Mm-hmm. Then, then hopefully they get the glory uh, when it all comes out. I don't know. Yeah. 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 And, and in all of it, like, you know, I, I understand it's a massive pressure cooker. I kind of think that, you know, someone is going to dislike a, a, a Star Wars no matter what. Right. Mm-hmm. But it's also so important to me. Like, yeah, but but so much of the spirit of Star Wars has always been like, ah, let's try this. Right. Let, let's go do something different and new and find out. Find out. We're all going to find out soon enough. At the mm. Excel Center in London, when we are all on stage and they bring out um, Josh Trank. They give him a second time. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, there we go. That's our look at uh, Linda Loft's first official comments, uh, soft confirmation, maybe all that stuff. Uh, exciting, exciting. Uh, before we get out of here, we're going to take a, a look at this week in Star Wars history. Looking ahead to Star Wars Pass, about one year ago, we look back on the day Variety first reported Sir Alec Guinness had signed on to play a desert rat who was once a leading general in the Galactic War. But uh, this year, this time around on the podcast, let's go to March 24th, 1976. Uh, I was oh, about a month away from being alive. It was on this day in 1976 that Guinness and his wife arrived in Tozir to begin shooting his scenes as Obi-Wan Kenobi in A New Hope. We've talked over the years about how Sir Alec Guinness brought so much to those scenes on Tatooine that served as a tip of the iceberg storytelling, if you will. With the Obi-Wan Kenobi series now behind us, and I completed my rewatch uh, for now, at least it could be season two. What makes you appreciate what Guinness brought to those scenes while shooting them in 1976, Jen? Oh, my goodness. Well, you know... <laughs> He brought his acting gravitas, but there is a twinkle in his eye in so many of those scenes. He seems like, you know, a grandfather who would give you a piece of chocolate, even though your parents said, no, don't give them sweets before dinner. <laughs> right? No worthers. No worthers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and there he does, he classes up the joint uh, in, in that film yeah. and yeah. Uh, he grounds this crazy world with, you know, this, this Wookiee and the Millennium Falcon, just, there's just so many fantastical elements, but his presence and his performance really makes that world along with so many other performances makes it feel so real. Um, so thank you, Mr. Alec Guinness and R.I.P. Yeah. Great stuff indeed. And, and Joseph, I know you Spent a lot of time studying the words, and movements, <laughs> and actions of Obi Wan Kenobi, and uh, I just finished uh, my Kenobi series rewatch this weekend. And 
that last hello there, all that stuff. It, you can't help but think of this stuff. And and for me, before I uh, hand it over to you, I, we talked about him looking off and a uh, look of the eye means years of Clone War episodes. You know, mm-hmm. we have got all this stuff. Uh, no, it's me and all this, all those connections. I, I think there's such a, a warmth to the character of Kenobi, but also a, a quiet pain that is 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 full of purpose once it really hits. I, I just love that the subtext there that Guinness uh, brought to the role, and 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 that shows up so many times just just in the Kenobi series for me. That that kind of vibe of who he is really setting the tone for the character a lot there. Going back to seventy six. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I really agree with what what both of you are saying, and I think his performance had such value uh, back in the day of 1977 of really approaching this is, yep, they're laser swords and laser beams and something called a Jawa. Okay. Um, People aren't going to take this seriously unless they believe that it's real and it matters. And I just, I feel like that's so much what Guinness is, is playing Mm -hmm. throughout but in particular in that pivotal, pivotal scene with with Luke where, you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi uh, shares what Star Wars is about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that he plays it with weight. And, and I think that's what that's what was successful in 1977. It made you lean in and go, OK, this stuff is real. It mattered. Something happened in the past. He's affected by this hologram. This is a big deal that this is happening. This is not every day. Uh, Guinness played it like Destiny was calling. Yeah, and that's that was powerful when it came out. That was powerful when there was nothing else because it made us believe. But then, it, it, you know, as you're saying, Ken, it's it's just been such a gift through the years, right? Yeah, uh, you you get to 1980 and that little uh, look to the side and <laughs> slight rocking before he tells him yeah. what happened to his father is a gift. It mm-hmm. already in 1980, mm-hmm. uh, the prequels come out and the the kind of bittersweet sadness of and a good friend. Uh, that pays off when you can now flash back to all the times Anakin and Obi-Wan had together. Now with the Kenobi show, the weight he looks at the the hologram, like it mm. finally happened. She's finally calling for my help again. It's It's been a gift that just kind of keeps paying off uh, mm. that, that reverence that, uh, that Alec Guinness played the scene with. Mm. And final thought, I, I think it does tie to the Kenobi show so powerfully because the Kenobi show is, is really about him refining who he wants to be as a Jedi and setting off on a journey. And Obi-Wan Kenobi in a new hope is, is the absolute end of that journey. He's Mm -hmm. been through his journey. He's found his peace, you know, and he's all about getting Luke ready for his journey now. Yeah. Mm, Yeah. That look, all of it. I I love, I love your point of, Already by 1980, we are getting paid out from this uh, this casino. Hands <laughs> <laughs> up, more yep. mm, so true, so true, so true. Thank you, sir, Alec Guinness. Hey, whether or not you fully love Star Wars or not, it doesn't matter. You, you showed up, and that's what's important. And I love seeing shots from that era, some of the BTS stuff. Uh, he was having fun there. He might have not known what a Jawa was, but he 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 knew what he was doing, and he wanted to play this wizard in a morality tale and he did so mm-hmm. well all right we are out of here we are out of here indeed here's where you can find us we're on twitter at four center pod facebook page is four center podcast we're on instagram and youtube check out youtube the uh, latest episode of figure fights is up it's a great one stormtrooper george lucas uh, razor chris grogu go find out who win uh, who won that match um over on our YouTube channel. Podcast is available at Acast, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, and more merch available at tpublic.com slash user slash force center and patreon.com slash force center is where you can support us directly from there. Get into our Discord and celebrate Star Wars with Force Center friends. You can follow me uh, at Ken Napsock. Go to my website, kennapsock.com. I'm revamping a lot of my YouTube page as well. I'm uh, sort of leaving Twitch and heading over to uh, YouTube to game stream. And a lot of things, uh, a lot more things coming to there. So head over there if you'd like more of me. Jen, where can I get more of you? You can find me on Instagram and YouTube at Jennifer Landa, at Jennifer Landa 1138 on TikTok. I have a new video out about the similarities between Chapter 19 of The Mandalorian and Andor of all things. So you can check that out on those sites. It's great. I gave it a Please. thumbs up or a heart or whatever I had to do on that platform. I <laughs> thank you. Just thank a, you. Just a, where are your platforms? <laughs> Jennifer, I watched your video on multiple platforms because every time it popped on, it's like, I want to watch it again. Oh. Uh, 
No, it's great. Appreciate People have been, that. you know, having having such fun discussions. Uh, it, it, some good spirited and some uh, mean spirited. I snoozed a news organization on Facebook because it, it had a snarky oh. uh, version uh, uh, of the uh, Mandalorian mm-hmm. and uh, uh, and or comparisons. But I thought your analysis wow. of of Coruscant and, and the the way the different designs are being used to show the different eras was just great. Mm-hmm. Really wonderful stuff. Thanks. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, for me, I'm on all the social media at Joseph Grimshaw, still on Twitter, uh, trying to be on Mastodon as well. Instagram, uh, I am having fun uh, creating videos on TikTok. Am I not unboxing videos? And I'm putting those up on YouTube as well. You can find me on YouTube. Just search for Joseph Grimshaw. Check out the comedy and the short films. And uh, if you want to check out those not unboxing videos on YouTube, uh, go ahead and try. Uh, the algorithm is trying to keep us apart, everybody. Uh, the last few you, uh, shorts I posted, like 20 people. <laughs> no. it, it, you, it, it, it's just, it, hey, and if, if only 20 people like them, fair enough. But it just, when the previous one got 800 views, it mm-hmm. feels more like an algorithm than a response uh, to the actual content. We live in such weird, weird times of computer. Tell me what you want. <laughs> yep. yep. And then like, mm, but but is that what I want to give the computer? Anyway, a longer podcast. What do we want to give the computer? Uh, fi- final thing I want to say uh, quickly is um, there's another uh, vote forward campaign. This is I, I talked about this uh, uh, a lot during the main election cycles. Uh, but there's always important things going on right now. The organization Vote Forward is uh, running a campaign where you can write letters uh, to the people of Wisconsin, not encouraging them to vote in any specific way, but encourage them to use their power to vote. There is a very consequential uh, Supreme Court uh, appointment, or I guess not appointment, a vote in Wisconsin coming up. So I'm writing letters for that, and I wanted to let people know about it if they wanted to check it out. The website is votefwd.org. Check it out indeed. Great stuff over there. Get out and vote. Uh, But for now, we're just getting on out of here. We'll see you next time here on Foresight.